So good morning, everybody, and uh, a warm welcome to this webinar and launch of a new background report on biodiversity in the financial system, which we call the missing link. And my name is Linda Bell, and I'm a programs director at MISTRA. Uh, MISTRA, uh, and if you have questions during the webinar, uh, please use the Q&A function in Zoom, and we will try towards the end and pick up some of those questions. Thank you. Um, MISTRA is an independent foundation established by the Swedish government in 1994 with an original endowment of about 2.5 billion crowns. Uh, in accordance with its statutes, the foundation funds strategic research with the purpose of solving complex environmental problems and creating a good living environment for all. MISTRA is also an active asset owner and in that role, the foundation early on acted as a pioneer in the field of sustainable investments. And today, more than 25 years on, MISTRA has invested close to 5 billion in research and more than the original endowment rem is remaining uh, to invest in future research programs. And today we're glad to launch uh, a background report with relevance for both of MISTRA's foundational pillars, research and sustainable investments. And the work on this report, which took place during the spring of 2021, was led by Simon Sadek, who's the chair of finance by biodiversity. And the other authors are Simon's colleague, Andreas Merkel, Charlie Dixon from Vivid Economics, Mia Panzer, who is a policy analyst, Thomas Kastner from the Senckenberg Biodiversity and Climate Research Center, and Natalia Tichenko from the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program. Our first speaker today, uh, Mia Panzer, has worked for many years as an environmental policy analyst and researcher in London, and recently returned to Sweden to work on biodiversity-related issues at a government agency. Mia's focus is on EU policies and processes, and she's authored several research reports, analyses, and book chapters, including on the implementation of the EU nature directives in Sweden, environmental integration, and socioeconomic benefits of nature conservation. So please, Mia. Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you also, Mr. for inviting me to, to speak at this webinar. Um, so Linda has asked me to start off with, with some of the context to set the scene for today's topic on the links between biodiversity and the financial sector, uh, the basics, if you like. And I would like to just begin by saying that the starting point and the main focus of, of the panel putting this report together has been uh, how to halt the loss of biodiversity. Uh, and, and like I said, looking especially at, at the role of, of global finance, both public and private. Um, biodiversity is defined as the variability among living organisms. We have used the, the Convention of Biological Diversity's definition. Um, and it includes also the diversity of ecosystems. And uh, I don't think it comes as a surprise to anyone listening into this dialogue, but just to re-emphasize that over an extremely short period of time, uh, humans have caused degradation and loss of biodiversity at an almost unbelievable scale, and it is not slowing down. Uh, you have all seen these dramatic stats, I'm sure. Um, I won't go into them in, in detail, but uh, just to mention EPIS 2019, uh, showing that 75% of Earth's land surface is now significantly altered by humans. Um, the population of wild species globally has been heavily reduced by as much as 60% uh, in the last 40 years alone, according to WWF. And, and here in Europe, um, over 80% of the most carefully protected habitat types still remain in a poor or bad conservation status, according to the EA, despite decades of trying to, to do something about that. Um, and this situation is, of course, symptomatic of, of our ways of life, our economic development, maybe especially since uh, World War II. Uh, this development has been an amazing achievement, of course, in, in terms of human well-being, for instance, but it's, this process has been based on a linear, inefficient, and, and wasteful economic system, 
that has caused land use change, pollution, uh, driving climate change and, and biodiversity loss, for instance. Um, and in fact, today, the, the system itself is, is in many ways overdimensioned. We, we are living well beyond the available resources in many parts of the world. And, and Sweden is certainly no exception, rather the, the contrary. Um, of course, we are very much part of biodiversity. We depend on diverse, healthy and resilient natural ecosystems. Uh, so this biodiversity crisis is certainly also a crisis for, for humanity. Um, and the people who understand this far better than I do uh, say that we only have a limited time left to, to act uh, before basically we cross too many, too many tipping points where we have no idea of what the out outcomes might be. Um, what we do know is that once we lose a species, there is no way of getting, getting it back. <clears throat> and once an ecosystem is pushed beyond a certain stage, in most cases, it's not possible to retrieve that process or to imitate or replace the functions that it filled with some sort of technical solutions. So all in all, we are not only destroying what makes this planet unique, as far as we know, um, we are actually knowingly <clears throat> creating a more dangerous and unfamiliar place for future generations to, to, to live in. And with that uplifting introduction here in the morning, um, maybe we should come back to today's topic and, and uh, the report that the panel has put together, which, like I said, focuses on what we do uh, about this. Um, and of course, overall, uh, the world, there has been major efforts in the past, say, 100 years to protect nature, uh, normally using public budgets. We designate protected areas, we regulate harmful activities in, in different ways, etc., etc. We have agreed uh, high-level international and regional goals and uh, made commitments uh, in this space, uh, the 1993 UN Convention on Biological Diversity at the global level is one example. Here in the EU, we've had a political goal uh, of halting biodiversity loss since about that, that time, since 1998. That's now 23 years ago. Um, and these efforts that we have taken have had a, a major difference. Uh, made, a, made a major difference, but existing appro approaches also have many limitations, uh, mainly because nature conservation has been notoriously underfunded in public budgets, certainly in the EU, uh, and especially when it comes to monitoring and enforcement, which you might say is, is the most important aspect. We've also failed to <clears throat> address these underlying drivers that I mentioned related to our ways of producing and, and consuming. Uh, <clears throat> we are still losing biodiversity faster than we are able to, to protect or, or to restore it. And this all boils down to our inability to take biodiversity into account in economic and investment decisions, uh, but also in planning and follow-up, benchmarking, et cetera. Uh, we need mechanisms to help illustrate the role of biodiversity, including the values of the benefits that we derive from it for our well-being and, and our development. Um, just to say as well, obviously, it's impossible to put a price on biodiversity, uh, but business as usual is simply not uh, an option. Um, <clears throat> and the, there are a lot happening here, which I am sure you're all aware. There's quite a lot of thinking in this space and in the paper we explore uh, parts of this. Uh, for example, there is a large body of research now on ecosystem services, how to value the benefits that we derive from these, uh, and also the specific role of biodiversity in ecosystem services. Um, there are taxonomies for sustainable investments being developed uh, in the EU and also elsewhere. Um, and I believe my colleague on the panel, Simon, will talk, talk more about what is going on in this nexus, as we call it, in just a moment. Uh, but just to say as well that uh, in recent years, we have, uh, we've seen 
uh, absolutely unprecedented political attention to biodiversity, mind you, from a very low uh, starting point, um, especially in Brussels. We have the European Green Deal, which is the economic growth strategy of the current commission, uh, and it puts climate, natural capital, as they call it, and social justice on equal footing and at the very center of, of the entire strategy. Um, it's a vague political document by its nature, yes, but it is the first time that we see these goals receive such political weight uh, in the EU. Um, in May last year, we also got the new biodiversity strategy to 2030 uh, from the commission, <clears throat> and that has been called rather ambitious. It's been generally well received, even by environmental NGOs. Uh, and it has been supported by all member states in council. And recently, just, just last week, uh, the European Parliament also supported it with a huge majority. Um, and this strategy emphasizes, amongst many other things, the role of nature to human health and to our economies. Uh, it puts emphasis on, on the business case of investing in nature. At the national level, the EU and its member states, as you know, have shared competence on environmental policy. Uh, so as an EU member state, a great majority of, of Sweden's political approaches to these, these things are directly or indirectly based on EU policy. Uh, Sweden has also signed up for the biodiversity strategy, as I, as I said. Uh, it is a political commit commitment and not binding, but there are uh, legal measures, legally binding measures that will be developed as part of carrying out the strategy. We'll see a, a nature restoration law, for instance, by the end of this year. Um, member states will also be uh, responsible for implementing, of course, these goals and new rules and also to integrate biodiversity into sectoral policies, including on, on, on forests. Um, so just to wrap up, things are certainly happening very fast on this, um, but it is an extremely complex field. There are several uh, links missing here, which is the, to the topic for today. Um, on the one hand, it's about mobilizing private sources of funding for traditional conservation measures public budgets are certainly not going to be enough. Um, on the other hand, it's about finding ways for finance to reduce its negative impacts on biodiversity uh, from their investments, but also to identify investments that can benefit nature. Um, and if you compare to climate, for instance, you've, we've come quite a long way there. Uh, in what investors now take climate risks into account to a much greater extent than only five years ago. Um, and maybe what really pushed the needle there was uh, this realization of, of stranded assets. But on biodiversity, we're simply not there yet. Um, and I'm, I'd say it's probably also more link, uh, complex linkages uh, involved than on climate. Um, I'd just like to end with saying that it's crucial, I think, to remember here, which we also put quite some emphasis on in the paper, that without appropriate checks and balances, this development could also generate unintended consequences that do not deliver for biodiversity or even go against uh, these goals of halting biodiversity loss. Uh, the main interest of private finance, of its purpose in fact, is to generate uh, a return to investors. Um, so effective governance plays a critical role, not least because of these multiple trade-offs involved, uh, of course, comparing future benefits with present costs is one example there. But with that, I will hand over to, to Simon to, to say a bit more on the biodiversity economy nexus and the investable domains that the report identifies. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thanks a lot. Uh, I actually just want to squeeze nice. in a, a, a short follow-up question um a lot of interesting um trains of thought there in your in your intervention but uh, one thing that i wanted to pick up on you mentioned the eu the eu biodiversity strategy for 2030 which of course sets up pretty ambitious targets which you mentioned and also in which the commission says that they aim to close the implementation gap right so that's pretty 
it's a pretty ambitious statement. But um, for those of us who are a little bit of uh, EU policy nerds, we're also aware that there are other uh, political agendas ongoing at the same time at the EU level. Uh, not uh, just to mention a few, but the industrial um, policy and the agricultural policy, the cap. Um, so what are you, what's your view on the challenges here and these perhaps conflicting political agendas on the EU level and the status for the biodiversity agenda as such in that context? Yes, certainly. Thank, thanks, Linda, for the question. Um, so, so the Commission's work on closing the implementation gap, that's, that's mostly about making sure that member states follow existing law, uh, some that have been in place for decades, uh, like the EU nature directives, for instance. Uh, and that's very much ongoing already, uh, as you can see in, in current pilot processes and infringement cases, also against Sweden. Um, like you, like you say, it's not necessarily conflicting political agendas. Uh, these ones, it depends on how you look at it. Um, I suppose from a cap perspective, uh, of course, well-functioning ecosystems like soils, for instance, they are a, a condition for the sector to operate in the first place. Um, and there is a big span between working with na nature rather than working against it. There are less harmful practices uh, there are nature-based solutions to pest control, for example. Um, others with better understanding of agricultural practices are perhaps better apt to comment than, than I am, but um, I think I'd rather maybe call it trade-offs, uh, which is always the case in policy making. You have different societal agendas and, and goals, and they need to they need to work together in, in this case. Um, for instance, the 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 battle against climate change and, and, and against biodiversity loss certainly have to go hand in hand. And this can be extremely challenging, of course. Um, uh, on, on agriculture, again, the, the biodiversity strategy and the, the farm to fork strategy were published by the commission on the same day to emphasize all these linkages and dependencies between, between these two ambitions. Um, and I suppose part of the problem here, coming back to what, what I was saying before as well, uh, is this fact that the role of biodiversity is not taken into account um, in the same way that perhaps climate is, is now, uh, or other interests, obviously. Um, you, need to, you need to have a fair chance to compare the different options in front of you uh, based on, on sound science and evidence. Um, often, I think biodiversity becomes simply this nature conservation agenda uh, seen as a, as a barrier to, to certain economic activities, and, and that might sort of uh, change the, if we can just find better ways of, of visualizing the role of biodiversity better, uh, it could change, change the outcome of that trade-off. Um, lastly, maybe it's just to say also that, of course, in these processes and uh, making these trade-offs is essential to have like solid transparency, multi-stakeholder participation, um, to not allow one interest to dictate the outcome, um, which in, in, the, in these trade-offs, which are crucial to all of us, in fact. So maybe I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Mia. Thank you. Uh, and then now on to the next speaker, um, Simon Sadek, who has been uh, leading this work from um, uh, with the background report, and he's the chair of Finance for Biodiversity and director of Migrant Nation. Um, Simon was the head secretariat for the UN Secretary General's Task Force on Digital Financing of the Sustainable Development Goals, senior advisor on finance in the executive office of the Secretary General and co-director of UNEP's inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. Um, I could go on forever. I'm just also gonna add that Simon uh, is also the co-chair of the informal technical expert group of the task force on nature-related financial disclosures. We're really glad to have you here, Simon, please. Thanks, Linda. And, and actually, apart from thanking Mia for sort of setting out the frame really well, this is more broadly a thanks to Mistra. Um, I think the work of the panel has been uh, very helpful and very timely, uh, not least because we're in the middle of a, a sort of classic upswing in the innovation cycle 
in the nature, biodiversity, economy, finance space. Uh, and the question of kind of what kind of knowledge to create, when, how, for what, uh, I think is extremely timely uh, right now. So, so I think the work of the panel, the paper that we're putting out today under a MISTRA frame, hopefully will be relevant to MISTRA, but, but I'm hoping will also be relevant to many other both researchers and research support organizations thinking about knowledge generation in, in this space. So, so I'm going to start um, with just a question, uh, which I know you can't answer directly, but at least answer in your minds. Um, the question is, um, is the global economy um, nature dependent to the extent of 10%, 40%, or 100%. Now, the World Economic Forum concluded that the right number was 40%. So 40% of global GDP, about 80 trillion US dollars currently, um, is significantly dependent on nature. That was the WEF position. Um, but I would suggest to you um, that the number is actually 100%. Uh, that of course, it sounds absurd and perhaps has no immediate practical significance, but, but the truth is, is that the entirety of our global economy is dependent on nature. Remove it, that is nature, biodiversity, and you remove the global economy itself. Now, how do we translate that into something practical? Because it's sort of true, but also perhaps not entirely helpful. You know, do we want to think about nature markets as we think about carbon markets, for example? Uh, so biodiversity offsets in various different shapes and forms, whether voluntary or statutory compliance markets. Or do we want to think about biodiversity as traded biodiversity, uh, such as non-medical farmer markets, which are growing very rapidly? Um, or do we want to think about nature markets as somehow metrics regarding embedded nature? You can buy a shirt today that has a QR code on uh, that shows you not only how much water was used in the production of the shirt, but ensures or reassures the buyer that that water was extracted legally. That's a sort of another way of thinking about a biodiversity market. And of course, the list is endless. There are many different ways that we can conceive of what nature markets are. And in fact, the reality is, is that whatever definition you choose, all of those types of nature biodiversity market interfaces exist at exactly the same time. So we're dealing with not only biodiversity heterogeneity, as we all know, but also um, the way in which biodiversity intersects with markets and the global economy. Uh, and we're trying to get our heads around how to manage that more effectively. And the only thing that we're absolutely clear about is that there isn't a single metric, uh, a carbon ton equivalent, uh, that there isn't a single target, a 1.5 degree equivalent, uh, so that we're dealing with a world of high complexity uh, and trying to figure out how to ensure exactly to Mia's point that the continued destruction of nature uh, through the way in which we run our global economy can be not only slowed down, but in fact reversed. So um, Finance for Biodiversity, the organization that I chair set up originally by the Marva Foundation in Switzerland has a goal focused on the finance side of this story. Uh, so its goal is to increase the materiality of biodiversity in financial decision-making. And that includes global financial and capital markets, uh, but also includes within our frame, uh, public finance. Uh, it includes, for example, not only fiscal side of public finance, but also the $50 trillion plus that currently sit on central bank balance sheets. And it also includes our own spending as citizens. Uh, and that obviously, is largest when it comes to consumption, you know, $47 trillion a year plus. Um, but equally, we are savers, we are investors, we are pension policy holders, 
uh, and we are taxpayers. So we, as individual citizens, also shape the way in which finance, biodiversity, and markets um, interlock with each other. So um, our work at Finance for Biodiversity <clears throat> has really tried to grapple with the question uh, of how we begin to ensure that biodiversity is considered more material in financial decision-making across those many different spheres of finance, which of course, at one level, uh, as we all know, and I'm sure we'll come back to, is a matter of measurement. Yeah, you manage what you measure, that old adage. And there's now a considerable amount of work emerging on the measurement side. Uh, Linda has already made mention uh, of the task force on nature related financial disclosure, if you like the more recent cousin of TCFD, the task force on climate related financial disclosure. We have the network of central banks, now 90 central banks uh, on greening the financial system, NGFS, beginning to migrate beyond its original focus on climate related risk and beginning to look at biodiversity related risks to financial stability, so within their mandate. Uh, and in all of these areas, as well as the upsides, the opportunities that may arise, uh, the measurement challenge is clearly very significant and has to be addressed in order to make significant changes to the materiality uh, of biodiversity and financial decision-making. However, that may well prove not to be enough. We know within the carbon space, a lot now about the notion of stranded assets, and that has allowed us to build transition risk frameworks that consider changes in asset valuation and allocation associated with climate risk, and that has driven the materiality of climate or aspects of climate into financial decision making of various different kinds. But actually, most nature related effects on economic assets are indirect. They have to do with dependency relationships, not necessarily the nature content of the economic asset itself, such as the equivalent with say coal-fired power stations in climate. And so the question of how to create materiality rather than only to measure it becomes an important part of our agenda in F for B. And that's very much reflected in the discussions of the panel and the contents of the paper have looked at things like changes in the law, increases in liability and litigation, the effect of changing public opinion and citizen behavior as consumers and in other ways, as we discussed before. All of these are ways not just to measure materiality, but to increase the materiality uh, of biodiversity uh, across multiple parts of our global economy, uh, and therefore, to influence the materiality uh, of biodiversity in financial decision-making. A large agenda, but one that is rapidly coming into the center of policy-making without doubt, and is also rapidly becoming of increasing interest to certain segments of the business community, including a growing portion of the financial community, hence the creation of TNFD, NGFS, uh, and others. So what does that translate into when it comes to research? You know, clearly all of these topics are very interesting uh, and therefore in and of itself are subject to intellectual endeavor, you know, that is curiosity driven, but also needs to be application driven. Uh, we can think of the importance, for example, of understanding practice more effectively. So come back to the definitions of biodiversity markets themselves. You know, and in my examples earlier, I illustrated that one can think about biodiversity markets in many different shapes and forms. You know, would you include alternate protein um, uh, developments, uh, the so-called, you know, no-kill burger um, as an aspect of a biodiversity market, for example, not, because of the way it impacts biodiversity, but actually because of the decoupling uh, of uh, fake meat production as compared to livestock uh, from nature impact. So the possibilities of how we think about biodiversity markets clearly needs to be subjected 
to both intellectual discipline uh, rather than dogma or narrow views, back to that 40 and 100% story, um, but also needs to be subjected to much greater practical investigation. The issue of data, you know, clearly important, we all understand, especially spatial data, you know, needs to be subject to greater analysis as to what kind of data in what kind of context, but also how to ensure the right quality data, or does there need to be ways in which data is built into collaborative pools or open source platforms? So applied research, I guess, would be my bias given the work I do, but clearly sitting behind that needs to be deeper theoretical research as well. And of course that translates straight across into the finance area, the focus of F B, and not the only topic within the MISTRA paper and the work of the panel, but clearly a significant focus uh, of our attention. Uh, and the question of not just how uh, simple lending, if you like, within the agricultural sector, the most obvious area to look at nature impacts might actually work or be made more effective with biodiversity becoming more material, but looking across a wider range of financial institutions, a wider range of financial instruments, a more complex and variegated range of public and financing flows and the way in which they relate to each other, including, of course, the whole fiscal space and uh, the whole policy regulatory space as it relates to public finance. All of these areas are in rapid dynamic change. And our understanding of them needs to be codified, but codified often prior to there being extensive data sets regarding prior practice being available. So that speaks to, if you like, the kind of research that's needed, not only the topic of the research that needs to be focused on. And then I wanted to come back to one of the final points that Mia made as well, which is the issue of governance. Clearly, there is a binary polarized discussion out there, you know, don't allow market processes to intervene or become too interrelated with biodiversity at all, because the financialization of biodiversity is in and of itself a problem. So that will tend to push one more towards policy driven, um, top down uh, biodiversity control models, so parks, reserves, and so on, um, against the other view, uh, which is that aspects of the financialization of biodiversity, i.e. the creation of biodiversity-related markets, are what we need, um, partly because we need to continue to draw on uh, biodiversity ecosystem services, but partly because that's one way in which to ensure that investment flows will be aligned and supportive of, of regenerative biodiversity initiatives. So that polarized debate, of course, uncovers in the middle the matter of governance. You know, markets can be good or bad, as Mia says, can have unintended consequences, unfortunately can also have expected negative consequences if one's trying to, if you like, sweat biodiversity on behalf of financial capital too much. And so the question of what new models of governance we take on or develop or how we enhance existing approaches to financial regulation, to policy, to voluntary initiatives and so on, all speak to the question of how we create a generation of biodiversity markets, or if you like, a biodiversity rich economy that is regenerative of biodiversity, whilst at the same time allowing us to draw the kinds of ecosystem services we need. Final point, Linda, so absolutely perfect timing. You know, I would sort of conclude by saying, again, the positive side, I think, of the paper that we have developed as a panel is not so much that it contains blinding insights. Uh, I think much of what is there is well-framed and draws from the richness of many other people's work. But what is helpful is that it begins to set out as Mia put it, an investable domain, i.e. a set of areas that research should be undertaken and can be invested in, not only for MISTRA, we would hope, but also for other research communities around the world and other funding bodies around the world. So with that, let me stop, Linda, and pass back to you with many thanks. Thanks a lot, Simon. 
thank you. And uh, we, we're now moving on to the section of the webinar where we have two um, uh, perspectives on the paper. We have uh, um, sent out the, uh, the report to, uh, to a couple of commentators, um, uh, very prominent ones. So, and the first one uh, is Felix Preston. He's the Director of Sustainability Insights at Generation Investment Management. And uh, Felix is responsible for developing Generation's thought leadership on sustainability, including leading on the firm's flagship annual sustainability trends report. Prior to joining Generation in 2019, Felix was a senior fellow at Chatham House, where his research covered, among other things, a low carbon transition economy, circular economy, and the global natural resource trade. Welcome, Felix. Thanks very much, uh, Linda, and thanks very much um, to Simon and Mia for setting out uh, the, the report so clearly. Um, uh, and, and thanks in particular to, to Mustra for inviting us today, but also um, giving us the opportunity to review the report, which is um, uh, a really fascinating read. Um, Generation is, a, is a, a sustainable investment firm set up 17 years ago um, by, among other people, Al Gore and David Blood, and is, is very much focused on how to deeply integrate sustainability within um, long-term investment practice. So this is obviously a really important um, topic for us. Uh, th this, this report comes at a super important time. I mean, for, for us as an investment firm, biodiversity, we obviously see and hopefully help with it rising up the agenda very fast. And Mia set out very clearly why that's important, which is the, 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 the extent of the ecological emergency that we face. Uh, and we need obviously some very practical responses to deal with what is a very complex challenge. I really value the, the way the report has synthesized a lot of that um, uh, uh, complexity in a way that points to action. Just to maybe restate um, a couple of the, 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 uh, the, the report messages which really resonated with me with that before I give a few reflections on how we might think about this as an investment firm. This point about how biodiversity can't be treated as existing uh, outside of the global economic system. This is really Simon's 100% point. Uh, really struck home with me, I think. We're only gonna be able to tackle the climate crisis, su generally survive on this planet and address social equity challenges too, if we approach all of these things in a, in a connected way. And I think we are sometimes guilty of treating, treating this as a bit piecemeal. Um, and, this, this second uh, point, which Simon concluded with, um, how on the one hand, biodiversity markets are part of the solution and, and, a, and a powerful vehicle for change, but they also need to be carefully governed to avoid the risks around what the report calls excessive financialization. For me, this question of how to scale and innovate biodiversity markets, but also with the safeguards that we need is the, is the central dilemma that we're, that we're trying to um, figure out, certainly from an investment perspective. At um, Generation, we've developed an approach that we uh, call uh, system positive investing, which helps us to analyze individual companies within the context of a system, normally a system in, in a transition to a more sustainable state. So uh, you wanted to reflect a little bit on how we might apply that to um, biodiversity and biodiversity markets. I wanna make two points here. Firstly, from our perspective, it's not enough if a company appears reasonably well placed to survive a greater focus on biodiversity by financiers or by regulators or, or, or by um, uh, uh, non-state actors of all kinds. We wanna see companies actively contributing to and shaping the transition to uh, nature, uh, a nature positive economy, a biodiversity rich economy, uh, through the way that they engage their supply chains, the products and services that they develop, how they enable and work with consumers to change behavior in a sustainable direction, and also in their policy work. So we're really looking for uh, uh, companies that over time will be helping to, to make this happen, not just cope with um, biodiversity risk. And I think the, um, the, the system positive framework in general is about for us helping to identify real opportunities. And one thing that strikes me about this discussion is that there really are quite a lot of exciting opportunities from an investment perspective. 
as Simon mentioned, a couple, you know, but if you look across the board, everything from regenerative agricultural practices, biomaterials, green infrastructure, rising consumer interest in, in bio-based products and services. Now, obviously, like the risk of greenwash is real, the need for safeguards, I think, is really crucial but at the same time the, the opportunities are sizable too so um this is quite it's quite exciting from an investment standpoint i wanted to make just a couple of reflections uh, as the other two speakers have also talked about the connection with the climate agenda and clearly for an in, for investors we um the investment world has been thinking a lot about climate change certainly for the for the last five years not there yet but uh, in terms of where we need to be but a lot of work has happened and so it's interesting to reflect on, on some of the, the lessons we can take from that experience. Well, one challenge we have is that it's difficult to pin down a single destination, which, which Simon mentioned. You know, the net zero concept has been really uh, a, a, a clear kind of destination for how to think about climate for all of its uh, the challenges that go along with that. Uh, it may be difficult to pin this down to a single goal in the case of biodiversity, but I think we do need uh, something to focus on. The second point is around um, uh, uh, metrics and accounting tools, which have been the real focus of investor attention on climate uh, and, and, and quite potent. But at the same time, I think one of the key lessons is that we can't afford to wait until that those are perfected. They're still not really perfected in climate. It's going to take a really long time to, to until we get a completely agreed framework around biodiversity, potentially. And we can't let the precision be the enemy of the good or the enemy of near term action. I do think there's quite a few no regrets options in the biodiversity space. And we're particularly thinking a lot about how investors can contribute to ending deforestation. And there are other obviously uh, ways to attack this too. Um, there are gonna be some uh, 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 investments which are necessary from a biodiversity perspective, but don't look that attractive from a traditional risk and return perspective. So that points to a need for innovation in the financial world and also a role for governments in shaping those incentives. But investors are going to have to be on the front foot um, in playing a role in that if we're going to get out the other side. Um, and I think but both of the speakers have been very clear about the, um, the importance of governance. And this is governance and politics, I think we consistently underestimate in, in, the, in, the, in the climate world, uh, often as or sometimes more important than the technical challenges we face. So, uh, and this is probably going to be only more important in, 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 in the biodiversity realm. But um, as, as Mir pointed out in her talk, uh, we can't just read across directly from the climate discussion, partly because we haven't solved our, uh, what we need to do on, on climate, but also because this is a really different situation. We're dealing with very uh, place-based and context-specific challenges. So I think rather than drawing those sharp lines, as arguably I've done in my, in my comments, what we really need is a synthesis, and this report goes some way to doing that to help us to solve for the multiple objectives across biodiversity, climate, water, and of course, all the, the billions of people actually who depend on, on um, nature and biodiversity for their livelihoods. So I just wanted to uh, uh, leave it there really and thank um, again Mistra for commissioning the work and inviting Generation to participate today and, uh, and to thank again uh, Simon and Mir for their, for their comments. I hope we can continue as an investment firm in, in this process as it uh, develops. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Felix. Very interesting, and we'll, we'll um, hopefully um, get a chance to to have a little bit more interaction in a few minutes with uh, with the rest of the panel as well. But uh, now, just to our our second perspective on the report, um, and this comes uh, as Simon was saying, uh, the report points to a number of uh, what you call investable domains possibilities, as it were, for research funders to to contribute to the knowledge development in this very important space. And uh, we're really glad to have John on, on board also to give his perspective. John Tempain is the head of department for environment at Formas, Swedish Research Council for Sustainable Development. And John has been part of the management team at Formas since 2018. And his remit uh, includes uh, the National Research Program for, for Climate and the National Research Pro Program for Oceans, which is all uh, a new one. Uh, as well as, as, as an extensive international portfolio, including the EU programs for biodiversity. So John, please. 
Thank you very much, Linda. And I want to congratulate uh, Mistra on great timing with this report and also to congratulate uh, Mia and Simon and their co-authors on a really interesting report. It was a, a pleasure to read and gave lots of insight. As a research funder, I'm, I'm quite concerned with two things, timing and do we have capacity to work with these issues? I'm going to touch on those two aspects, mostly in my intervention here. And uh, both Mia and Simon talked about this issue of timing. And I mean, if I think back 15 years when the Stern Review came on climate change and the economics of climate change, it really had a large impact on the political discourse. I'm sure the economists here can discuss the finer points of methodology, but I mean, the impact that had on the political discourse and the general public discourse was huge and climate was being discussed in rooms where it never was discussed before, even if it should have been. And I think that maybe we're starting to see the same thing happen here with biodiversity. We have the Dis Discupta review that's come from the UK recently. We have these recent joint publications between IPCC and IPBIS. And I think both at the political level and the general public level, people have really started to understand the... Um, how large the problems uh, connected to biodiversity are and what um, uh, what's really at stake here. So I really think there's some momentum in these issues. As Mia talked about, there's lots of initiatives at the EU level, not least the EU Green Deal and how we're going to reimagine our societies after, the, um, after this pandemic. Uh, and here we see quite different approaches in different countries about uh, which strategies are being used, which investments are being made, which measures to recover after the pandemic are um, are being used and how green these are or aren't. Uh, I'm not sure if Sweden's best there. I don't think it is, but it's quite interesting to see these initiatives being taken. And of course, the EU taxonomy was mentioned here as well. And I mean, this has been very controversial uh, in different uh, areas and not least in Sweden. We've had have controversies connected to hydropower and to, uh, to forestry. Um, and I think here you see very clear linkages to biodiversity and it really proves the need that we need to talk about these issues, that we need to talk about them at a deep level, that we need to set them in context of what research needs are and how we need to understand these issues, which I think that uh, the report deals very nicely with. Um, so coupled to this kind of great timing that there's a growing political and public awareness about these issues, if I look at about capacity in Sweden, do we have capacity to work with these issues? And as you mentioned, Linda, we have, um, uh, we're a very strong participant in the EU partnership program, Biodiversity, looking at biodiversity. And there you can see that in Sweden, we really have some great research uh, in these areas. We're very strong uh, on classical biodiversity research, on monitoring, on conservation, on modeling ecosystems, ecosystem service valuation but we're also quite good at interdisciplinary work this kind of cross-sector approach which is really needed and i think reading the report you really see this need to to have a trans and cross-disciplinary approach and as simon was talking about both at the theoretical level and the applied level we also have some people in sweden doing very good work on synergies and trade-offs between policies and biodiversity climate other sectors at the nexus of food energy water um, and uh, biodiversity. Um, so I think there are definitely people that could take on these issues in Sweden that we have the capacity. Um, I also think that we have a strong fintech sector in Sweden. Uh, I was pleased to see that the report not only looked at AI, but also looked at blockchain technology and issues of uh, traceability, for example. So I think there are definitely um, people doing work in Sweden that could probably take on these challenges uh, that are pointed out in the report and, uh, and contribute significantly uh, to them um, and when we're talking about this kind of data issues we're we're great at data in Sweden we have a really good environmental data uh, but we've also at Formas identified the potential for us in Sweden to really work on AI for sustainability we see uh, a large potential here to be able to look at these issues and that there are people starting to to look in these areas and to be able to use the data we're looking on uh, something I thought about when I read the report was perhaps the need to, to get the ethicists and the philosophers and the theologians involved in these issues. There's some very deep philosophical issues about should we price nature or not, how we should uh, value nature on a more 
conceptual and, and uh, existential levels. So I would also like to see some of the humanities getting involved in these issues and helping to guide us uh, in these. I mean, well, when is the market uh, approach useful? When is the rights of nature approach useful? Uh, when should we think in different ways? Um, so I think definitely there are, there are some other issues as well that they could definitely be uh, come in here. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say, I mean, uh, these aren't trivial problems. These really, as the report points out, I mean, there's, there's some very deep issues needed here that we definitely need to invest in more research. And I mean, if we look to, uh, to climate or to water, we, we have a hard time pricing carbon dioxide and pricing water, and, and they're just single molecules. So I mean, ecosystems are very complicated and connect to very many different levels of uh, society and different sectors. So, so, I mean, quantifying biodiversity itself is quite hard and probably quite controversial. Um, so I think there's definitely the need for uh, investment in different kinds of research here that can take us to the next level and hopefully lead to uh, some really nice steps forward here. Thank you so much, John. That was uh, really useful and, and interesting also with some of the strengths of the Swedish research system highlighted there. Uh, now I'd like to just very briefly, we only have a few minutes left, but to bring in the, uh, the uh, authors, uh, representatives of the authors and also uh, Felix again. So if you just turn on your um, cameras, Simon, Mia and Felix, great. I can't turn it on. Um, oh, I think somebody, the host, I'm also off. <laughs> host has to let me. Okay, the host has to let you. Sorry. I think it's happening now. Okay, great. Well, uh, I know, uh, Felix, when we were talking just before the webinar here, that, that you actually had a question that you wanted to pose to, uh, to Simon. Um, so uh, I'm just going to let you go ahead and, and uh, ask the first question. Thanks, Linda. Um, yeah, Simon. So I wanted to come back to the point that you uh, you raised in your in your talk, but it's also um, definitely encourage people to go and read the whole paper, but certainly this section um, where you talk about um, materiality. And for those, uh, maybe lots of people on the call already know this, but um, for investors, materiality has become something of a core concept for how sustainability gets integrated in, into their work, but. It very often is it's it's it's, it's seen as, as a way of consistently applying a, a filter if you like so sort of a, a bar under which you don't need to look because the, the 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 damage or the risks are not serious enough maybe to put it an unfair way um and in your paper you make the case for how we need to take a more uh, a dynamic approach to the concept and also to treat it as something that we should define to we shouldn't be making mater uh, biodiversity material uh, if it's not already. Um, so I, my question is, um, to what extent do you think that the investors are ready for that shift? Do, do you expect some pushback or maybe it's supported in some parts of the community and not in others? And kind of where, where do you think we go? Uh, what, are, what are the key next steps we should take to, to, to make that transition happen? Thanks, Felix. You know, back in 2015, I asked the then um, first deputy managing director of the IMF, when will central banks take climate into account? Uh, and his answer with a grin was when they do. Um, and you know, his point was that materiality, however some practitioners would like to talk about it, is socially constructed, is subject to herding effects, is subject to leadership moves, is subject to fractured and discontinuous market effects. Uh, and of course is subject to a range of policy, regulatory, liability, subsidy, and other interventions by government um, or governments. Uh, and so um, the approach we've taken in the paper is both, I think, theoretically correct and practically correct, uh, which is theoretically materiality is a social construct um, and we can debate that out some other time. Um, which doesn't negate the uh, physical reality of scarcity, um, but the translation of scarcity into materiality conditions is largely within our choice yeah, as a society. It's a social choice issue. Secondly, at a practical level, uh, if we take climate as an example, 
Um, you know, many aspects of climate are not material to today's uh, financial decision makers, but um, a scenario based approach that allows us to build a transition risk model effectively brings future credit policy liability and physical risks into today's considerations where a more formal auditor or legally defined view of materiality would not. The TNFD at the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure has quite consciously adopted the phrase nature related risk, which includes the short term traditionally defined material financial risk, but also includes nature dependency and impact, not so much in the European mode of double materiality, relevance to the business and relevance to society, but with a view that nature dependency and nature impact foretells future material financial risks, i.e. that dynamic materiality using the language that the World Economic Forum has adopted. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thanks, yes. Thanks for the thanks, 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 me at least, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, pick up a question from the q and um, not sure to pose it to, but maybe uh, uh, Mia I can uh, I can see if you if you're ready to to try and 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 give it a shot. Uh, and this is on the risk uh, issue, uh, as as the financial sector is now seems to be quite ready to act on the biodiversity challenges ahead, with limited data available. Uh, what? Uh, what should they take into account acting under uncertainty, as it were, uh, when it comes to the risks? Um, so do you want to give it a try? I can it's try. A huge one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, of course, a, a very valid point. Um, we have big data issues still when it comes to monitoring the status of biodiversity, even mapping where we have uh, key areas of high biodiversity. Uh, so the very basics are still uh, being being developed, but I would say that that is happening now at an extremely quick rate with the technological solutions that, that now uh, are available that were not before. Of course, then it's a problem of baseline. Where were we uh, before and what do we want to get back to? Um, but we also do know a lot, uh, especially when it comes to the drivers, uh, the impacts of our various activities. We know that fairly well, um, and therefore waiting for you know solid solid baselines and, and better data is also not necessarily an option anymore. But working based on what we have uh, in the EU, for example, we have. Uh, these reportings under the, under the Habitats Directive, we have now done three rounds of that, so it's no longer an excuse to say that we don't know enough. Uh, we know, I would say, enough to, to do more than what we're doing at the moment. Uh, so from a, I cannot answer from a financial uh, sector perspective because I, I'm not part of it, but um, I don't know if that answers, this, answers the question, but if you thoughts at least on this data issue. Um. Thank you, uh, Mia. Uh, time is running really quickly here, but I have a, a, a follow or not, not a follow up, but a different question also from the Q&A and it's, it's around, uh, you mentioned this Felix and I think uh, Simon and Mia, you did too, but the, um, the biodiversity challenge, of course, being very heavily tied up with other environmental and, and um, um, societal uh, challenges. Uh, and, and of course, there are goal conflicts, but are there also positive uh, synergies uh, that you can think of uh, to, to try and end this in, a, in, a, in perhaps an optimistic mode? I don't know, Felix or Simon, would any of you want to try and take that one on? Would there be possible um, positive synergies uh, looking at uh, these various, these, these different challenges. I, mean, I can do, I can do a very, very quick um, um, response to this, I think. I mean, that's what we need to be looking for clearly, but I think it's difficult to answer in a sort of comprehensive way, certainly for us as, a, as an investment firm, when we're looking company by company. 
I, I suppose we, we, we really try to situate that company, what it does, what it's trying to do in the kind of industrial and the, the environmental ecosystems in which it, it interacts and to really understand kind of where, the, where that opportunity for um, uh, uh, solving multiple challenges at once looks like. We're trying to look for the end state, really, something that would be genuinely sustainable across both environmental and social uh, uh, grounds. And so, um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to um, try and answer it co comprehensively, but I think that's the that's the kind of key challenge that we face. And I hope that, I, you know, I mentioned our system positive framework. In many ways, this is an attempt to um, take on and embrace the complexity and uncertainty that we're facing in these arenas, but also try to hold companies to a, a high standard in how we're thinking about them. And, you know, we think that companies that cross that bar should be among those that are creating a significant value in the, in, in the future. You know, so it's, it's an investment proposition, not just a, a moral one. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. Uh, okay, I think uh, uh, we're just going to round this off now, but it's been a, a very interesting hour, at least to me. Uh, and uh, the link to the report is is in the chat function of the Zoom webinar. It will also, of course, be on mistra.org, uh, available to everyone. Uh, so just finally, from, from our side at Mistra, many thanks to the authors of the report and to the participants, the commentators from the panel. Uh, and a possible call in the area so for decision by Mistress Board uh, late August. And if you're interested in following this and other um, uh, news from Mistra, please sign up to our newsletter. And with that, I wish you a, a, a great day and a nice summer. <laughs>